Back to my girl for a second, too, before we move on from that. I thought it was interesting uh, how you had referenced the Rivette on there, because um, at the time, of course, these types of songs were unusual. Even before I Need Love, some of them, you know, had mentioning or focusing on girls so heavily that weren't a Roxanne, Roxanne, I guess. So, so what, uh, on the writing side of things, what made you want to reference like a Dear Ved and, and different things like that? Well, if you, uh, the, 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 the um, lyric went, let me tell you a little story about a girl that I've met, not Roxanne, darling Nikki or D. Vet. So I reference a uh, song I'm already named after women. Actually four, because I said Latoya, which was just Ice Hit Records. So I thought that was, I was trying to be clever. I don't know how many people caught it, but obviously you did, so I guess it worked a little bit. Well, that's, uh, that's what uh, I thought was, in, you had the James Bond references. That was the next part of what I was going to say. You had so, the LL was interesting for the rap side in the toy of course but then you had the james bond references and you had these other female for your eyes only and all that stuff um right so I, I was just wondering you know when people pull from the pop culture references i always appreciate it um and just always curious about it um uh, just just trying to be clever with the lyrics at that time you know okay. i'm a huge james bond fan i've got all the movies so you know gotcha so then with uh, the well, Pee-wee's dance getting on the Pee-wee's Big Adventure uh, movie later, did that like... Well, actually, it was never in the movie. But it was, I saw like, I remember having, well, I never saw it, but I remember having a single of it or seeing a single of it. Right. We have, um, we had clips from the movie because, um, okay, after Pee-wee did about, I would say about 250,000 entertainment got picked up by Electra, which is under the WIA label, the umbrella, Warner Atlantic Electra. So when we went to do the video, Pee Wee Big Adventure was also distributed by Warner Brothers. So they gave us the permission to use clips from the movie in, in the video. So a lot of people think that it was on the soundtrack, but it wasn't. So there was some single, though, that had it on there. Was that just a bootleg or something? That's the European release. Um, oh. I've seen it. I've seen it um, online. And um, actually, it's my Facebook cover page. But yeah, but um, I think the label in Europe was Cool Tempo. And I don't know how they, how they got permission to do it. But yes, yeah, a picture of Pee Wee Herman, I guess, doing a wheelie on his bike. And that's the single cover. Yeah, because I remember uh, I never saw those movies, but I was like, oh, that's cool. They must have used it. But now I find out they did. <laughs> so there you go. No, no. And also, Pee Wee Herman was supposed to be in the video. But what happened was he had just signed a deal to do um, that TV show he had. Uh, he had a children's show back in the mid-'80s. Uh, I forgot the name of it but it came on Saturday mornings. And he didn't want to, uh, quote unquote, get peewee up before the show started taping. So he had a full beard and, you know, like crazy hair. So I was like, well, if he's not going to look like who we're talking about, it makes no sense for him to be in a video. So that's, that's one of the reasons they gave us permission to use the mo movie clips. And also the teacher in the video was the guy, the actor, in the movie that stole a bicycle, Francis. This character's name was Francis. So he was the teacher in the Pee Wee's Dance video. Well, the other thing that's hilarious about all of this is now, like you had said, the movie wasn't in theaters and you couldn't watch it when you were trying to write the song. Now you can literally find almost anything anywhere. So it's just, right. such, it's so dramatic. Uh, Cause when I first heard that, I thought it was wild. Cause now we could just, you know, look it up online or find it on some streaming service and you could do the song that way, but that wouldn't have, that wasn't possible. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I actually saw the movie maybe a year after Pee Wee came out. Cause I didn't want 
um, just like you just said, you know, you found it amazing. It was like a really big thing in interviews that I didn't see the movie. So I wanted to keep that true. I didn't want to lie and say I hadn't seen the movie. So I kept that until like the PV started, uh, the song started trying to die down. Then I actually went and um, rented the videotape and watched the movie. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. So then what caused you to leave entertainment and then how did you get to Columbia to for what ended up being the Joe Cool album? I left entertainment because um I didn't feel I was a priority anymore. Um and this is like they were working on Keith's album and I felt like I was kind of on the back burner. We had, we was working on songs but it seems that Keith was not a priority. And nothing wrong with that. More power to Keith. I think Vincent could have handled that a bit differently. So, you know, I just I just told him, look, I don't want to record here anymore. So, um, and this is how I got to, this is leading how I got to Columbia. What happened was um, I was searching for a label. I had a couple of offers. And then I heard Def Jam was kind of interested. But, um, I knew I knew I knew Russell, I knew Leo, but I didn't know them well. So I wanted to talk to somebody that I knew. So I I ran into Hank Shockley, who I had met years before, and I knew they had a relationship at Dev Jam. So I said, you know what? Can you can you make the connection? Pardon me. So he linked me up with a, a meeting with Bill Stephanie, who was head of A and R at the time. So I have the meeting. The meeting was positive. You know, we talked. But as I, I left the meeting, um, Hank pulled me to the side and said, look, if you, because it was going to be a, a Rush Def Jam type of deal, you know, sign the Rush, get on Def Jam. So Hank pulled me to the side after the meeting and said, look, you're going to be one of like a thousand dudes over here, but I have my own situation. You know, I want you to hear me out before you, you know, have another meeting with Def Jam. So I agreed. And Hank, Chuck, a gentleman by the name of Ed Chaltman and another gentleman by the name of Ron Scholar had a management company called Rhythm Method. They managed, they co-managed Public Enemy with Rush. It, they managed Early Latifah, um, Red Alert, um, A Tribe Called Quest, The Jungle Brothers, basically all of the native tongues and a few other acts that, you know, weren't really big. What True Mathematics, I don't know if you ever heard of True Mathematics. Yeah. Or King, Kings of Pressure, which were groups that Hank and Chuck produced. Yeah. They managed all of those guys. So I had a meeting with those guys, and I liked what they what they were saying. So I signed to them um, for management and a production deal with uh, Hank, with um, the Bomb Squad and Rhythm Method. So um, Chuck, they, this was right before Nation of Millions to hold us back. So they were up there. They had a meeting. They, they had a listening party at Columbia right before the album came out. So a guy named J Joe McEwen, I believe his name was. I can't, you know, it was a long time ago. But Joe McEwen was head, head of A&R on the pop division of Columbia. So they, they so loved um, Public Enemy's album. They asked Hank, well, are you working with anybody that doesn't have a deal? Because I would love to work with you guys. You know, I have a relationship with you guys. So he said, yeah, we just signed Joe Ski Love. And Joe knew who I was. He said, the, the kid that did Pee Wee? He goes, yeah. He said, well, if you guys produce it, I'll sign it. So that's how I got the deal with Columbia through Hank and uh, the Bomb Squad, which they did end up producing the album. <laughs> I was going to say, then how and why did Herbie Lovebug and Invincibles end up doing the album? Okay, now... Shortly after I signed a deal with Columbia, Rhythm Method, the, the partners were bickering. There was a quarrel in the in the company. It was Chuck and Hank versus the other two partners. So they were splitting up and it put I was actually signed to Columbia for two years before the Joe Cool album came out. Because I was in court litigation. I was an asset. So they were fighting everybody's fighting over who gets to keep who, who goes to go where. But there was a clause in my contract with Columbia that said, if the company ever went into receivership, 
being Rhythm Method and the Bomb Squad, Columbia had the right to deal with me directly. Because remember, I signed a production deal. So that's what they did. One day I get the certified letter in the mail from Columbia saying they, you know, they're enabling this act. They want to deal with me directly, which kind of cut Hank and those guys out of the deal. Now, one of the guys who were was a um, a member of Rhythm Method, Ron Scola, the gentleman I, I um, brought up earlier, he was a partner. He was Herbie's personal manager. So Columbia was still looking for a named producer. They wanted some, you know, they wanted Joe Ski Love and Marley Marl, or Joe Ski Love and Teddy Riley, or Joe Ski Love with Herbie Lovebug. So that's what happened. Ron happened to, to ask, I guess they were in a meeting about something else, and Ron asked Herbie, hey, would you be interested in producing Joski's, you know, album on Columbia? And he's like, sure. So that's how that happened. Wow. That's a... Uh, I always wondered what the delay was and to find out that you were there for years before Joe Cool came out is, is wild. So going back to that time, being, uh, I guess, at around that time, you would have been late teens, just turning 20, early 20s or something? I was about 19. So yeah, what? Going on 20, probably. So then what was your, like, were you angry, frustrated? You just take it as it is what it is? Like, what was going on with you mentally at this time? Oh, I was very frustrated. Very frustrated. Because once I got to deal with Columbia, I had one of the better contracts in music history. My contract with Columbia was ridiculous. So I was very excited. And I was the first rap artist directly signed to Columbia. You know, they had Def Jam. They didn't really need to sign a group because they had Def Jam as a subsidiary. So I was really excited. I thought it was the perfect time. It wasn't too far after Pee Wee. So, yeah, I was just mad at everybody, frustrated, you know. Uh, you know, people thinking I'm lying. Anyway, uh, yeah, you don't have no new record coming out, but I did. <laughs> you know, even my father doubted me at one point. Hey, what's going on with Joe Ski Love? Like, I'm signed to the label. Yeah, sure you are. So it was, like, really frustrating. So what did you do during this time when you weren't making music? Like, were you well, doing I, had a, I had a nice advance, so I got to live off of that for a little while. And I still had a little peewee money left. So, you know, I just hung out. <laughs> just waiting for this for the you know the nightmare to be over okay so then what was it like going with to get to, to work with and getting to know herbie and the invincibles what did uh you guys click right away did it take a little time yeah, well, i knew these i knew i already knew them prior you know i used to hang out with eric b a lot and eric b grew up in the same neighborhood as all you know herbie kid and play so i knew them i already knew them you know we already had i wouldn't say we were friends but we had a relationship you know, respect for one another. So, um, yeah, it worked out well. You know, the vibe was good. Okay. And uh, before we get to some of the songs, I remember always thinking it was interesting that you uh, got credit for mixing on the album. So what? <laughs> you know, I don't I didn't even know that. <laughs> okay. Because I, uh, yeah. I remember when I got it and I looked at it, you know, I was, you know, little younger man at the time but i just remember mm -hmm. as i was learning about who did what and what meant what on the credits i just was like wow he mixed on this project so you don't remember mixing or you didn't really mix or anything and i was there um andre duborg which was um the whole invincibles um their team that was their their engineer he engineered everything salt pepper kid and play so i mean i was there I would go to sessions that I probably didn't have to go to, mixing, mastering, because I was just curious. You know, I didn't get to do any of that with Pee Wee. Vincent, you know, took care of all of that. And I chose not to go, because I might have went to one mix session and I was bored to death. I'm like, ah, I'm not doing that again. But with Joe Cool, you know, I figured, what the hell? You know, I waited all this long to get this thing out. I might as well sit through the whole process. So I sat in, and as he's mixing, I told him if I liked something. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, maybe boost that kick up, you know, do something to that snare, and he did it. But Andre did all the mixing. Okay. I just gave suggestions. 
Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gang bang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.